topic. Um, thank you for joining this um, webinar today. Um, we're going to be talking about um, bowel ultrasound, um, which would mostly entail um, an ultrasound case series evaluating the appendix and the bowel. I have nothing to declare. However, I love ultrasound. Therefore, I'm going to be a bit biased towards ultrasound today. Um, but yes, I find my love for ultrasound and I have nothing to declare. Here yeah, are my credentials. My name is Manuel Abdiola Babinson. I'm an adult and pediatric sonographer at the University of Leicester in Leicester, UK. And I have an MSc in medical ultrasound. I have a special interest in bowel ultrasound and I practice that on a daily basis here yeah, in Leicester. Yeah, the learning objectives. Um, at the end of this lecture, um, participants are expected to understand the perils and pitfalls of bowel ultrasound. Um, we are also going to discuss a lot about the bowel anatomy. Um, we are also going to discuss about um, bowel ultrasound scanning techniques, tips and tricks, um, the ultrasound appearance of the normal appendix, um, the ultrasound, ultrasound appearance of uncomplicated appendicitis, as well as complicated appendicitis, and we'll discuss about um, inflammatory Crohn's disease. Let's begin. In the past, I uh, can examine the eye, and I took, I did um, kind of some work among sonographers um, regarding their interest in bowel ultrasound, and it was interesting to find that, you know, in normal sonographers still believe the ultrasound cannot examine the bowel due to bowel gas. And people we still carry on that uh, mindset. I want to hope that we are all here today because we believe our son can actually examine the bar. And hopefully by the end of today's presentation, we would all be able to um, know how we agree that it's a myth um, that our son cannot examine the bar with any training. Examining the bar range from about 75 to up to 98%, which is really good and impressive if you ask me. Um, while the specificity also ranges from about 75 to 100%. Um, now this is highly dependent on the region that we're examining and also the nature of the pathology. For instance, if you're looking out for appendicitis, it tends to have a slightly different um, sensitivity and specificity compared to checking for erectile um, Crohn's, for instance. Um, also, the technique in which we adopt changes, you know, improves the sensitivity and sensitivity by a lot as well. Now, this technique would include um, transabdominal ultrasound, which is what we're going to be talking, which is what we're basing this um, presentation on today. Um, also, um, the endorectal ultrasound. Um, endovaginal ultrasound to examine the, the, uh, the rectum and the perianal region, um, the perineal ultrasound, um, the um, endoscopic ultrasound, which mostly examines the upper GI tract, um, contrast-enhanced contrast ultrasound, which, um, which is very useful in detecting slow flows, especially in cases of um, Crohn's disease when we're checking for um, for, for for fibrosis of the uh, for fibrotic uh, fibrostenosis uh, and also trying to uh, differentiate between fibrostenotic um, occlusion and um, um, inflammatory stenosis. Uh, so contrast layout of the is quite useful in that technique and also share with um, elastography is also has also been proven to be very um, to be very useful to increase the sensitivity and sensitivity of diagnosis of uh, bowel related pathologies. However, for the purpose of today's lecture, we'll be talking on transabdominal bowel ultrasound. So, what are the perils of bowel ultrasound? Ultrasound is a very useful imaging tool in examining the bowel, um, which we are going to see today. Uh, its real time feature helps in observing peristalsis. And also, we can perform sonal palpation, which is where we all do that, I believe, which is where we use the transistor. You ask the patient where the concern is, and we use the transistor to 
to check for um, for response to pain, and that gives us an idea of what area the uh, patient feels the most um, pain or or tenderness. Um, ultrasound is also widely available. It uh, compared to its counterpart, ultrasound is quite cheaper. Ultrasound is non-invasive, um, particularly trans uh, transabdominal ultrasound. And it can be performed usually without preparation. So in a case where, in an acute case, in, a, in an emergency setting where a patient, you know, um, turns up with significant abdominal pain, the doctor is trying to figure out what's going on. You can instantly send the patient to the to have them examined without um, without any prior preparation. Um, when done properly, ultrasound can prevent an unnecessary CT. However, we also need to know the limitations of ultrasound, and we should be more than ready to um, to to request further examinations when we know it's going to help our patients much more. Um, ultrasound provides more detailed information of the bowel wall than CT, um, and we all know that um, CT uses ionizing radiation. Um, MRI, you know, if patients who are claustrophobic might find it difficult to 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 to, to carry out an MRI examination, and also this if it's an MRI are much more extensive than ultrasound, you need more special or more um, more operators and more um, specialists around in order to carry out the examination and report the images in cases of CT and MRI, in which ultrasound once you have one. Um, well trained um, specialist, sonographer, radiologist, or gastroenterologist. They can carry the ultrasound right there and then and get the diagnosis while even showing the patient what's going on and it gives patients more understanding of, um, of the situation and the disease condition. Um, lastly, here, contrast and ultrasound is very useful for the visualization of wall vascularity. Um, which is which is a very useful tool in the follow-ups of inflammatory bowel disease. You now, the pitfalls of ultrasound: the small bowel cannot be imaged continuously in its entirety. Um, that you know, due to the anatomy of the small bowel, we can't follow we can't follow it all the way through. Um, ultrasound is very operator dependent. As a as a sonographer, a radiologist, a specialist, a doctor. You need to you need to really know what you're doing. You need to have a lot of training to be able to do our ultrasound. You need to yeah, it's very dependent on what you do um, and on what you know. Ultrasound can also be very difficult when scanning the bar in obese patients. It's not impossible. Um, we have scanned a lot of patients that are on the big side that would check with detected bar lesions and things like that. We are about pathologists. Um, there's five faculty of this. However, it's more tricky. But with the newer equipment these days, you have a real range of um, transducer frequencies, and you can use that to to your own advantage when you know when um, when you when you know what you're doing. And also, when patients have significant probes, significant tenderness, it, it tends to um, be a bit of a limiting factor because you might need to apply graded compression. And uh, with a patient who is seriously in pain, you might you know, that would most likely um, hinder you as the sonographer from doing so. Um, you need a very good equipment. You need a very good image quality. Um, an equipment that gives you good image quality. You need a multi-frequency transducer. You need to have a, a curvy linear and a linear transducer to be able to carry out a dynamic and complete um, bar of the Transabdominal bowel ultrasound examination. Um, and also, ultrasound is difficult to access the bowel structure in the pelvis transabdominally. However, with the use of endorectal ultrasound, you can easily see very beautiful images of the, of the rectum, the walls of the rectum, in, you know, uh, which is lodged in the pelvis. Sometimes the full bladder um, transabdominally, you can image the, the rectum as well. And then using perineal tracheal techniques, you can also image the the peri uh, in cases where you can have um, you know peri uh, anal fistula or uh, perianal Crohn's disease. You can use the perianal techniques to um, to image that 
the region, but in general, our journalists have been quite tricky to access both of the state characters. So, and also you can um, carry out a channel by channel, you can detect um, our legion using channel by channel adjustment. Now, the anatomy of the bar, um, we all know the alimentary canal, um, the digestive tract, which starts from the, um, the mouth, the food, the, this is the canal where the food passes, uh, food passes through um, from the mouth, obviously through the esophagus, down to the stomach, digestion starts taking place, digestion starts in the mouth, actually, you know, from the um, saliva ridges uh, produced by saliva glands. And then continues in the stomach and the uh, small intestine, large intestine, and um, the um, waste comes out as a species from the anus. That's the elementary canal. Um, however, when it comes to the bowel, the transcendental bowel, the bowel, we tend to, would most likely be focusing more on the stomach, the, from the stomach down to the rectum. Uh, the stomach, as we know, has three parts, the fungus, the body, and the pylorus. Um, we also have the duodenum, which continues from the pylorus as the first part, and then you have the second part, and then the third part. Then you have, then that continues as the jejunum. Uh, the jejunum is more visual, more um, identifiable and ultrasound um, because it has increased number of um, Verbalicon events is in comparison to the um, the ileum. So you tend to recognize the jejunum because you have you can see more verbalicon events. It's a very distinctive uh, distinctive feature in recognizing the jejunum much more. And the ileum, uh, so the jejunum continues as the ileum. Uh, then you have the distal ileum that ends at the terminal ileum. The terminal ileum is a very um, key aspect of uh, bowel ultrasound because it's um it's a it's a, it's a it's a very common location for Crohn's disease. Uh, so the terminal ileum ends uh, at the ileocecal valve and then uh, continues into the cecal pouch or the cecum and below the cecum is where the appendix uh, hangs. Um, so that region where you have the e terminal ileum, cecum and appendix is usually in the right iliac foot uh, around the point where um, it's mostly described as the Mark Bernice point. Um, and that's where we tend to use our landmark to find the appendix in most cases. Um, then, then the colon uh, continues from the sequel as the ascending colon, transverse colon, um, descending colon, and then sigmoid colon, and then the rectum and the, uh, the anus. So here's uh, an image or a beautiful image actually of uh, the digestive system. So you can see, okay, the mouth with all the digestive glands, the um, salivary glands, and then the esophagus, and down to about here, that's where the stomach starts. So here's the stomach, you can see the greater curvature of the stomach and the lesser curvature of the stomach. You can see the fungus of the stomach there, um, and the stomach, um, in the wall of the stomach tends to have increased rugged, so you tend to have rugged within the wall. Um, and then this ends at the pylorus, pyloric antrum, and then the pylorus, which then continues here. The first part of the duodenum, second part of the duodenum, third part of the duodenum, and then we start the jejunum from about there. Um, so you have mostly the jejunum, then the ileum. So you can see why it can't emit the small intestine in its entirety because it's all uh, very you know, interwoven in a way. Um, that, that's how um, God uh, created it. Um, but the Barosan still does a really good job at, in, in the, at um, examining the, the, the small bar. So uh, the, the jejunum continues as the ileum, which then continues as the distal ileum, and then the terminal ileum, and then the ileocecal bar is in here. And then you have the cecum or the cecal pouch up here, and you have the appendix hanging down there. Um, and the uh, cecum then continues up as the ascending colon. And you have the hepatic flexure of the colon there, and then you have the transverse colon here, and then the splenic flexure there, and the descending colon, and then the sigmoid colon, and the rectum. And then the anus. So that's um, that's a brief but but uh, detailed description of the um, the the bowel, the, the the small bowel. So on ultrasound, the 
but a normal borer would or would normally peristal, the tend to see peristalsis. Remember how to come give us the real time views of the bar. So if so, uh, so you tend to normal bar tend to show tend to show peristalsis, it tends to be compressible and you have the normal gut signature, which is also called the wall stratification or the wall layering. Now, what is the normal wall stratification of the bar and ultrasound? There are five concentric hyper equate layer of the bar wall and ultrasound. And these layers that are named the hyperequate serosa, the hypoequate muscularis propria, the hyperequate submucosa, hypoequate mucosa, and then the hyperequate uh, superficial mucosa interface. The wall thickness of the bowel is uh, varies along this part. So up uh, we just go back right? so the stomach wall tends to measure up to about six millimeters. That's due to the rule there. We're gonna have like the thickened wall even when it's normal. Um, the small bowel we tend to use about four milli up to four millimeters as the um the upper limit of the bowel wall thickness and then the large bowel up to five uh, millimeters. Bar wall thickness is a very important landmark parameter in, 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 in examining the bar. Um, the bar with an abnormal wall thickness is most likely be abnormal. Um, once you see an abnormal wall thickness, you need to look around for other features that would um, that would support that diagnosis. Other features like bar, like um, um, color, the color doctor, you check the color and uh, interrogate okay for. Uh, Hypervascularity, uh, check for free fluid, and things like that. We're going to get there. So, contention of the normal bowel. A common feature of uh, the small bowel is the presence of bowelly convergences. Um, these are more seen in the upper jejunum than the distal area mentioned before. Um, they are sometimes more obvious when the bowel lumen is fluid filled. Um, also, in cases when you have a small bowel obstruction, it tends to have. Uh, distended uh, bar proxima to the point of obstruction. Therefore, you see the public convergence just hanging around, hanging down on the wall of the bar. Uh, they tend to be much more, uh, much more uh, prominent um, when 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 the when the lumen is fluid filled. Um, uh, but the large bar, the number of it, they have frustration, and this is very. Um, very characteristic of the large bowel, and they are usually seen as echogenic guidance. Uh, echogenic track for the large bowel. So um, usually, when the when the large intestine is normal, we tend to see this. So this is a this is a treatment from a 26 year old female patient. Um, it's a normal appearance of the large bowel. So that's the uh, transvascular. You see the obstruction. The obstruction is there. Um, this echogenic uh, gas pocket here, uh, the this, this echogenic area, the gas that um, uh, that hangs at the anterior wall of the large bowel and prevents you from seeing the rest of it. But that's absolutely normal. Yeah, that's um, this is the tra the same patient tra um, defending colon of the same patient that's on the on the, on the right side of the colon. So that's the illustration, and you can see the, the um, gas pocket there, the anterior wall of the bar. Um, so here we have a 29 year old female patient um, with uh, normal appearance of the duodenum and the jejunum. So this is what, so this is the, uh, the distal stomach slash um, pyloric antrum. Uh, that, then that, that then leads towards the first part of the duodenum. So we can see, you can see the wall of the, of the distal part of the small like, yeah. um, so the duodenum there. You can see, much. You can see the left lobe of the liver here, and also the um, left of the part of the head here. So this image was taken right in the epidastrium, just there. Um, and you can see the, the normal, which you can see gas pocket, the gas flowing to the anterior wall of the stomach and pylorus there. And on the right side of this image, you can see the, on the screen, you can see the um, jejunum with more prominent uh, valvular conveniences. Like I said, they 
usually much more appreciated when the women of the bar is and this women is for the color. So uh, uh, usually within the prepared bar, you tend to have empty women, so that helps you better uh, to see it. I, I must mention that the in preparation for an ideal um, bar of your you feel better off having a patient who's been fasting for at least a hour. That helps to empty out the body and make it and reduce the bar of gas and uh, sugar that struggling. And hopefully that helps with disability more. And when you can't see things uh, clearly, you can use the most natural or in that way. And if you uh, give your patient a cup of a drink or what wine in the examination room, and then you see how the, the fluid passes through the room. And that helps to identify the raw uh, stratification and all that thing. Now we come to uh, scanning techniques. So it is a it is a and yes, I have an answer. It is my so as a shot and yes, I mean always and that we are tell it um check for all other possible um cost of the patient, especially when they want to get a fair and acute case and patient rights in the apostate or left in a lot of things we are in the with uh crisis we have to scan everywhere first, make sure we do that to very anxious, do that more blood problems that it also rule out before we then focus on the bar. So when you're done scanning the abdominal organs, then we then it's advisable to look then so, um, continue, we continue using your curvy linear probe. Um, the probe we use is a multi-frequency probe. So it goes up to about six to six point five megahertz uh, for curvy linear. So you can increase your frequency to about that if, if it goes up to four or five megahertz, that's still fine. So you, you increase your frequency but reduce your depth. Um, in such a way that you can that you bring everything closer to your screen. Um, so it's have a good look at it always that the sigma equal and I'm only that way. And just do that and go slowly check do check just check for any abnormal bowel or sickness, any area of hypo or if there's calcis, um, any long mass, um bowel dilatation, I mean liver dilatation, narrowing, some things like that. Um so sweep is incredibly and then switch to a linear transducer, which is between five and the lab. I normally just use nine megahertz, but to be more to be precise, I would use nine megahertz uh, linear transducer. So you so you do exactly the same thing. And when you find an area of um, bowel wall thickening or any suspicion of abnormality in the bowel, you, you, after scanning everywhere, you come back and focus on that. You know, you try to again target that uh, transversely and longitudinally. Try to identify what what part of the bar you know the anatomy now. Okay, and tell what what part of the anatomy that is. If you find um, an, an evidence of um, um, small bar or trachea dilatation, it's always important to find the cause of that obstruction to so follow that dilated bar loop to the point where it's no longer dilated. And usually around there you find the cause of obstruction that could be caused by a lot of things. And while standing, remember to apply graded compression. You can use this technique to the top um, right corner of the screen here. Apply a bit of pressure on the patient's back and just um, press slowly but um, but firmly. While standing, but that technique helps to um, eradicate the um, bowel gas and it, it helps to bring the bowel closer to the transducer which in turn gives you more uh, higher quality imaging feedback which will help with the diagnosis. Um, so apply the graded compression and um, when you are in the epigastrium yeah, yeah, the, the here yeah, you tend to see the stomach, the pylorus and usually the duodenum which is what I showed you here. So that's the epigastric region, the epigastrium. You see more of the stomach, the pyrus, and the um, first part of it, the duodenum. And um, if you come down a bit, you can then see it, then see the jejunum and the transvascular. Um, so yeah, so you can follow the the, um, the stomach and the pyrus, the duodenum, and then the jejunum, the ileum, and you can just follow that all through like that so you, you get to the terminal ileum which is around where the transistor is the terminal ileum and then from there 
you get to the, the the terminal what it's always very important to identify a normal terminal helium i'll show you a lot of the image of terminal helium today um, so once you identify that and then the stick home will just be next to it to the right to the patient's right um and um and just around the heliocytical region you find it, the appendix and somewhere there so it's always important that's why you check everywhere then come around and take your time in the right side to be able to visualize those important barriers and landmarks which are the terminal ileum, the cecum and the appendix um so for more uh, more scanning technique um the cecum can be imaged in the terminal ileum in the right area so far as mentioned earlier um if you look at the image on this side here you can see that in some cases you turn your patient to a left lateral the cubicles position that would help move the um on what the unwanted small bar around the move the way out of the way and then it brings out the appendix and, and, and the fecal so it makes it easier to image sometimes that works and if it doesn't put your patient back on the supine position and continue at the same here so the um, appendix is usually in close proximity to the cecum and the terminal ileum. Um, the rest of the colon can be imaged by following its anatomical course, which is uh, I normally do do it in reverse. To be honest, I normally come from the sigmoid colon around here, um, and then just follow that up to the um, to the um, descending colon. So over here, you find the bladder. If you don't have the food that you might be able to see a bit of the rectum. Um, but in most cases, in most cases of uh, when we scan the uh, the bar or using transabdominal technique, we don't tend to see much of the rectum. But the sigmoid colon tends to be um, diagnostic. Visualize the sigmoid colon probably tends to be diagnostic, especially when we are ruling out obturative colitis. Um, so the sigmoid colon I follow the um descending colon up to the splenic flexure and then you then follow the transverse colon which i showed you earlier and um, so transverse colon all the way down to the apathic flexure and then follow the uh ascending colon but in reverse now so ascending colon downwards and then you get to the fecal and when you do that you know you um you are in conjunction with standing more in the line to check the small bowel you know you've covered a lot of the bar you can be rest assured that you most likely if you don't have slowly and correctly you most likely haven't missed any bar pathologies um so the rest of the column can be made by following an anatomical course that we are sending transverse descending and sigmoid column but like i said i agree reverse the sigmoid descending transverse and quite a lot of um, literature that i have um, encountered and some textbooks as well and even um, conferences where renowned gastroenterologists who have written a lot of books and, and bowel ultrasound delivered lectures they expressed um, the um, consensus that they also um, scan the bar in reverse from the sigma colon they find it easier and more organized to do so so it's come from the sigma colon all the way back and that's partly because you're sitting on the right side of the patient uh, here so you want to get the distal most part the part that is away from you first, and then you can follow that course like that slowly until it comes closer to you. So that way you're working your shoulder left, and uh, and it, 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 you don't lose uh, muscle tone when you when you're going when you get to the other end. Meanwhile, instead you're coming closer to you, so it's easier, and you're able to focus more on the scanning. So. Um, the, so we can so we should use color and hard or plus when we find um, abnormalities um, to interrogate structure. The normal bowel don't tend to really um, give much color signal. Um, however, when there's an inflammation, you tend to find increased color signal. Um, you tend to find bowel thickening. Um, in, in many cases, you also find uh, uh, mesenteric fat edema around it, so the bowel is a bit calm around that area. Uh, there will be no peristalsis or reduced peristalsis. Uh, you might find a bit of free fluid. Uh, you might find luminal dilatation or narrowing. 
you might find collection and access and then like I said earlier, methentheric edema. So those are the signs that you that, that you could reach a, a place where there is a, a possibility of uh, abnormalities. So when you're there, you need to be more focused, more you need to take your time more. Um, so the appendix, the appendix is a blind ended tubular bowel structure. It arises from the cecum. So in the images here, we can find the cecum there. So this is a close up image so they made on the right side of the So you can see the terminal ileum there, um, distal and terminal ileum. Terminal ileum goes into the idiosical, continues with the salva into the um, cecum or the cecal pouch, and then you find the appendix hanging down there. So this um, area here, you can see the appendicular artery. Actually, um, and uh, you have the mesenteric fat. So when the appendix gets inflamed, the fat gets uh, in the muscles. Um, so the appendix can either be antithical, cecum appendix antithical, or retrocecal in orientation. And the position of the appendix can vary due to its orientation anti or retro, or sometimes the cecum itself can be low lying or or, or lie upward, they can have the second hand in a bit higher. So you have to make, make the appendix a bit higher. And in some cases, the second comes all the way down and uh, the appendix is well into the pelvis. And some appendix are just longer than the rest. Um, some literature um, that I've encountered um, gives us the length of an appendix to be between 8 and 20 centimeters long. So it, it, it varies. Um, but in most cases, you find it in the um, in the right iliac fossa. So um, the um, frequently you can see the um, the medial and you can see the appendix medial and caudal to the psoas, iliopsoas muscle, um, which I'll show you in more in more images. And it obviously is very in length and sometimes extend into the pelvis. So the normal, on ultrasound, normal appendix appears to be blind ending, tubular, non peristaltic but compressible loop of bowel when it's normal. Um, it's wall has five layers, just like the other bowel structures. Remember the five layers of the bowel, um, hyper, hypo, hyper, hypo, hyperechogenic. So hyper, serous layer, muscularis propria, subserosa. Um, so, so um, most large copia submucosa, mucosa, and the mucosa in passive. Those are the five layers of the bar, and it's exactly the same in the appendix. Um, the appendix measures up to six millimeters when it's normal in AP caliber. That's a combination of the entire um, anterior posterior caliber of the appendix. Um, so the wall tends to be around 2.5 to 3 millimeters when it's normal. Um, so it's less than or equal to six millimeters in total AP caliber when it's normal. Um, the lumen of the appendix of the normal appendix can, can contain some air. In some cases, you might find some fluid in the lumen, even though it's normal. You can find fecal material, and, or you can find calcification, which is uh, called appendicolis. So even a normal appendix can have appendicolis. You know? um, so we'll look at some cases, um, some cases where we found the normal appendix, and I'll show you some images that accompany that were acquired during those um, examinations. So this is case one, the first case is a case of a six-year-old female who presented with three-day history of right-sided pain, fever, and vomiting. Uh, Seriatic reactive protein was 107, which is a lot. And uh, the white cell count was 12.7. Um, I think we, the landmark we use in our trust is 10. So when CRP above 10 and the is above 10, then it's abnormal. And that gives um, an insight and a, um, a suggestion of inflammation going on. Uh, so, ultrasound on this patient reviewed a 4 millimeter normal appendix in the right iliac fossa. And due to the continuous spike in temperature, and the clinical subs, uh, suspicion of appendix perforation. The clinicians were thinking if they didn't have the perforated appendix because even after having the ultrasound, they still felt like, you know, the appendix can be normal. She must have some kind of appendix perforation. 
and as uh, CRP keeps going on. So the same for a contract PT examination, which also reviewed a normal appendix and suggested right hyaline crisis. So this is the image of the appendix. So here we can see skin. So you look at the top left corner of your screen. The skin, subcutaneous layer, the superficial subcutaneous layer, the subcutaneous layer. Then we have the anterior abdominal wall muscle. And then from here, you can just start again the peritoneum and the bowel. So this here is the appendix here. So it's a bit soft too. But it can, when normal, it can be that subtle and can be that tricky to see. So I'm literally just saying about 50% of normal appendix are not visualized on ultrasound. Um, in, in many cases, it can be a bit tricky to see the normal appendix, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Because when we do, when we, when we confidently um, visualize the appendix, but then we can, we can say, you know, yes, this patient does not have appendicitis. And the doctor can focus on trying to find what the actual cause of of the patient's concern. Um, so to the left, to the right side of the screen, yes. Excuse me, right on the screen here, we have a transverse view of the same normal appendix, measuring four millimeters there. And then I just sketched out the schema around the appendix there to help you see better. And, um, and just here, you can see the appendix there. So that's a normal appendix. Everything else was normal. As far as I understand, it's concerned on this patient. Um, so, this is the second case of a 35 year old female presented with one week history of right iliac fossa pain and no fear. And we can see that she had a normal appendix here. Uh, we can see uh, a bit of the, the normal bowel, most likely the fecal there. And just here, we can see the normal appendix again here. So that's, uh, so that's the normal appendix there. And the same patient can see a normal bowel loop. And then the normal appendix there, blind ending, tubular, non peristaltic but compressible um, loop of bowel. So here we have a terminal ileum. So you can see it opening into the distal ileum there, or opening from this, continuing from the distal ileum there, and opening into the fecal here, the little you know, gas become um, materials, you know, chine in the, you know, become a um, chine in the, um, in the distal end of the terminal region going into the, um, into the elliptical valve. We couldn't really make the elliptical valve here. Yeah. Um, so this is the terminal ileum there. And you can see the low stratification, the individual layer of the valve there. And you can see the caliper placement of the measurements there. So we can be short and terminal ileum as CI. So case three, um, a seven-year-old female presented with ongoing intermittent abdominal pain and bouts of uh, vomiting, reduced appetite, lethargy, uh, nausea, and weight loss. However, her blood results were normal. So this was a pediatric case. Um, and here we can see the appendix there. Yeah, sometimes when like normal it can be that subtle. But like I said earlier, it's quite um, nice to be able to see and image it confidently uh, because that helps prevent any further investigation like carrying out the CT scan on a seven year old. Uh, if we can do answer the question with ultrasound, then there's no point um, exposing our patients to radiation. So here again, we can see the body um, appendix, the normal appendix there. Just there. And then over here, you can see just here. And you can see the iliopsoas muscle there. Um, you can see the um, ilia vessels here. So you can see the iliopsoas muscle here. You can see the appendix media sweep so there. Where in this case, it appears more anterior, but it's uh, more of media. Um, so, case four. A 21-year-old female presented with one-day history of pain radiating to the ultrasound revealed a normal hemorrhagic cyst in the right ovary. Ultrasound done that so patient had another ultrasound eight months time uh, for some other reason and ultrasound with the and the emergency hemorrhagic cyst had resolved. So 21-year-old patient 
most likely that was a pain, but her appendix was normal. So it must it most likely would have been the pain, uh, the pain would have most likely been coming from the hemorrhagic space in the right way, which was the trans vaginal examination. And here we have the, the normal appendix there. And also here you can see the um, iliac vessels here. So the normal appendix just goes on there. You can see that. So that's normal appendix, and that's the right ovary with the um, hemorrhagic space within it. And the fifth case, a 28 year old female presented with um, tender right iliac profile and supra pubic, um, tender right iliac and, and pain with the supra pubic, pubic region. The WCP and CRP were normal. Again, it was 10 for ultrasound query in appendicitis. days. However, ultrasound reviewed a normal appendix in the right iliac fossa and a complex, um, hemor uh, complex ovarian cyst on transvaginal ultrasound. Patient did not have a TV scan. Uh, sorry, when we run this on transcendental ultrasound, patient did not have a TV scan. It was declined, um, but it didn't have a scan again in five months' time. And this, the trans, uh, the hemorrhagic cyst had resolved on another CA scan. So um, this was the appendix here. And you can see in color the brow, you can see uh, just uh, some artifactual Doppler signals. They are not real. Um, that's the appendix there. So here we can see an example of wrong caliper placement to measure the appendix. So during the actual scan, the appendix was measured um, wrongly, but then after the scan, we used uh, PACS and uh, were able to use these measurement um, function and PACS to um, put the caliper in the right place and get the proper measurement there. So that's a um, normal appendix here. Now, case six, um, a 29 year old female admitted with one day history of right iliac fossa pain, nausea, vomiting, and tenderness. Blood test reviewed um, slightly raised WCC. Ultrasound of the abdomen and pelvis was performed and reviewed a normal appendix. The cause for patient symptom was not found on ultrasound. So here we can see a long appendix there, all the way there. You can see the iliac vein. So you can see here that there's evidence of compression because the iliac vein, um, external iliac vein here was compressed here. So you can see the, the appendix where the artery is not compressed. But over here, when the component the, uh, the pressure was relieved a bit. Now you can see the appendix here. You can see the vein is back open. So um, yeah, so that's the normal appendix, and you can see it better here. And the seventh case, um, so a year old female presented with one day history of progressive pain, vomiting, and nausea, and dizziness. Um, the blood inflammatory markers were all elevated, um, including amylase. Um, our ultrasound was requested with query appendicitis. The, um, the other one reviewed a normal appendix measuring six millimeters and gynecological causes for patient symptoms. She was in a lot of pain when I examined her. Um, and you could see the other song, the appendix and other was normal. Um, it was a very beautiful appendix, actually. Uh, you can see the individual wall layering and you can see that that's all normal. And the entire appendix still measured. Um, um, it's in the limit of an AP caliber. Um, there you can see normal ball loop there, and the trans was the, the city appendix nice and beautifully there. And then patient had a TV scan which reviewed this in the two ovaries actually. So patients um, did not have any further imaging and went on to have uh, um, went on to have um, um, an emergency uh, intervention for this. Because she was, in a, she was in a lot of pain. So appendicitis. Appendicitis is uh, the inflammation of the appendix when it's, in, when it's more than six millimeters in AT caliber. It's often triggered by liminal obstruction, lymphoid hyperplasia, and some other rare causes like you know, Crohn's appendicitis, ETC. Um, the most common reason, the appendicitis is the most common reason for. Um, emergency operation in the Western world. And the usual 
treatment is surgery, usually laparoscopic appendectomy. Um, sometimes the trial will open laparoscopy when, um, when, when things have gotten a bit out of hand. Um, for instance, in situation of uh, significant peritonitis, upstairs, and things like that. Uh, we try to cut it early before it gets it gets that out of hand. Um, and it most peritonitis uh, mostly affects children and young adults. The clinical presentation of appendicitis usually includes a combination of an acute onset of pain in the right area on the right cost, right area, but sometimes part around the umbilical cost migrate towards the right area focus. Um, you also tend to have nausea, vomiting, then when the blood um, examination is carried out, you tend to have um, elevated CRP, elevated WCC, neutral field, and things like that. So a combination of one or all of two of those would normally, uh, especially with the right area focus pain, would most likely um, put the clinician's mind towards the possibility of appendicitis. Um, and then in our our trust with that with that combination, patients are referred to, to ultrasound to have a full abdomen and tell this ultrasound and then focus on the bar to be more focused on the appendix. Um, and then uh, if this if the, if the CRP and the BC are raised or if one of the two is raised and you don't find the appendix on ultrasound, then patient goes ahead to have a CT scan to to confirm that there doesn't have a appendicitis. But if you can find a normal appendix on ultrasound, the patient doesn't need to have a CT scan. Um, so just always, always, you know, appreciate that you can confidently find it. You don't want to make things up and uh, misguide the, the clinician. So uh, clinically, appendicitis can be categorized as an uncomplicated or complicated appendicitis. We can also see the signs, the evidence of this, and we can differentiate this on ultrasound usually. Uh, uncomplicated appendicitis is an inflammation inflamed appendicitis appendix with no secondary feature. Usually the most common is the most common um, commonly encountered appendicitis we see on ultrasound where the appendix, some people call it um wall appendicitis. So the wall of the appendix is inflamed, and that's it, that's that part. Um, no obstruction or anything like that, no abscess, or no calculus or anything like that. And it has been reported to be successfully managed with antibiotic therapy. So most of these patients can possibly have antibiotics and go on to the general life. However, there are a few um, literature I encountered recently um, about, about follow ups on patients who have had antibiotic therapy for uncomplicated appendicitis. A number of them do possibly tend to come back with a reoccurrence in about a year or so afterwards. Um, but a good number still don't have to, you know, come back for it. So it puts the surgeon in the dilemma whether to, you know, carry out, continue carrying out antibiotic therapy if worth it, or you know, just take out every inflamed appendix, appendix as soon as it can claim to avoid the occurrence. But uh, that's something the surgeons are concerned about. So if we look at this case number eight, eight for today, um, so it's a 19 year old female patient who presented to the uh, gynecology assessment unit in our trust um, with a six day history of worsening abdominal pain, intense pain, actually 10 over 10, and some left iliac focus tenderness. Ultrasound was done today. So the, the gynecologist requested an ultrasound to rule out ovarian portion. Um, and um, when the ultrasound was carried out, the patient had. And it's in the appendix and it's in the normal ovary. So here we have a few images here. Um, so here we have an image of the right cilia. So by using a, a linear transducer, you can see the frequency here, nine megahertz linear transducer, reviews the uh, inflamed appendix there, and we have mesenteric fat edema wrapped around the appendix. You can see the echogenic. Uh, mesenteric fat there as well as mesenteric fat edema. Um, and then here we have the um, the transverse view of the, the inflamed appendix with the mesenteric fat there. Still the same linear transistor, the linear transistor um, And here we have the measurement of the appendix there. Um, I can't remember what it measured, uh, but yeah, it was inflamed. Um, and there, and 
then here we have CI seminar ilion. So you can see a normal seminar ilion. The seminar ilion is never blind ending. We've got it opens, it continues from the star ilion and open into the sequence. So it's uh so you can see the terminal ilion here, and then here we have the left ear poster with normal bowel loop. There was nothing indicating pain in the left ear um, on ultrasound. And here again we have down towards the down into the pelvis now we have everything was quite clean. We could use the nine megahertz uh frequency linear transmission to image the pelvis. And maybe to the image of these ovaries with normal follicles there. I can see the appendix just next to the ovary. There, which might have explained why um, the gynecologist would have anticipated a gynecological abnormality. Um, but it all really looks, looks normal in ultrasound. Um, so, this is a case that also highlights the use of ultrasound in examining the appendix and the bar. Um, so, the case, case number nine, now, just five year old female was admitted with like lactose pain and abdominal tenderness. CR2 was high theory, so at least it was normal. Transabdominal ultrasound reviewed some reactive lymph nodes in a significantly tender right iliac fossa. So the right iliac fossa was very, very tender, um, but we didn't see anything on the right iliac fossa while scanning transabdominally. Um, we could only see some reactive lymph nodes and maybe a bit of necessary edema, but nothing on sword. Um, so then we went ahead to do a transvaginal ultrasound, but couldn't see much of the ovary from uh, the transvaginal view. Uh, so transvaginal TV reviewed a seven millimeter inflamed uh, and tender appendix in the right adnexa, which was confirmed um, on laparoscopic appendectomy. So here we have the transvaginal view. You can see it's a bonus around this right area fossa. We can't really see much going on. And then we could see the the reactive link nodes there. Um, not the so um iliac vessels there. Um, and then we did a chunk by an ultrasound, which revealed hypervascularity, uh, an apparent bowel loop, their blind ending, tubular, non-compressible, and um, doing sonal palpation, the patient told me, you know, it was tender. Um, she felt most of a tenderness there. Uh, you can see it's medial to the right of the there into the structure there that's the appendix in the other way. Here is uh, another sense of um, look of uh, probably the speaker. Um just yeah, more of a solidarity um pickling reaction, but it wasn't it wasn't explained, it just appeared a bit prominent the wall. And there you can see the appendix there. And you can see it's just just here as well. So transparent ultrasound. Um, can help to confirm um, an, a pelvic uh, bowel pathology, pelvic appendicitis, and things like that. And also now we 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 are all aware that the appendix can be, can be a bit low lying into the pelvis. So it's always important to have a general view when looking at uh, the destruction. So case thing, if a seven-year-old male, this time male. Was referred to ultrasound with a day history, yeah. right sided abdominal pain with nausea uh, but no fever. So, while the VCC was raised, the RP was raised, and um, the doctors queried appendicitis. Ultrasound reviewed a uh, nine millimeter inflamed appendix in the right area for adjacent necessary edema and some free fluid. And uh, also mild fecal wall thickening. So this was the case of a sort of 47 year old male. As you can see, the, uh, the appendix inflamed here in the right lacosa, um, sensory edema around it there. And uh, you can see the thickening of the thickening there in the right lacosa. So um, features were consistent with um, appendicitis. So case 11, um, it's a six-year-old female was present, presented with um, a four-day history of right lower quadrant pain, nausea, and she was unable to walk due to the pain. Um, WCC was slightly raised, neutral fuse, so that were normal. Um, ultrasound reviewed an inflamed appendix, which 
measured seven millimeters in AP caliber. So we can see the uh, the appendix here. Um, this actually is uh, it's a it's a, a nice view of of the appendix because uh, we can see the individual walls there. So if we just have a little recap, um, I'll say uh, the serosa layer, the muscularis propria, hypoechoic muscularis propria, then the hypoechoic submucosa, uh, the hypoechoic mucosa, and then the hypoechoic mucosa interface, which is also the legal name. And that's the same here with the appendix there. Um, and then you can see the terminal ileum. There you can see where it's continuing from the distal ileum. There, and then it continues into the second there. And there. So you can see that that's a normal terminal ileum, but a mildly, marginally, mildly inflamed appendix. No matter how many six millimeters and below, this was seven millimeters. So yes, it is inflamed, but not complicated. Um, case number 12. A 35 year old female presented with one day history of right upper quadrant pain. She feels sick, feverish, and had raised inflammatory markers. The patient was known to have polyrhythmiasis for five years now, and she's had previous pain in the past. She's had ultrasound that confirmed gallstones and pain. So this time around, she, you know, she has presented with some acute pain in the right upper quadrant. And uh, the doctors um, were suggesting um, an ultrasound to check for complications from the from the um, gallstone. So this scan was done by um, one of my colleagues with, um, who I was training um, on that day, and then this this very afternoon. Um, so she scanned this patient and you know checked the gallstone to scan for so so scan for and the gallbladder, we did see the gallstones. They didn't look like they were causing any acute problems. And you can see this image of the gallbladder the gallstone and the common bowel duct there. You can see both of the gallstones there. So at the end of this time, patient mentioned, um, so we asked the patient, oh, so where exactly is the pain? And then she said, you know, it's down here, not up here. Um, I don't know why we don't have to get the check up here, but the pain is actually down here, this new pain. So I took uh, the transistor and then had a look and blue and view. We found this. So the appendix was in the right here for the We can see the um, mesenteric fat edema. You can see inflamed, um, non compressible tubular blindness in appendix uh, in the right iliac fossa. It measured, um, I can't remember what it measured, but probably it was inflamed. It was above six, definitely above six, about seven or eight millimeters. It was inflamed. So we um, concluded that it was the case of appendicitis, active appendicitis. So this was a 36 year old male who presented with right lower quadrant pain, which was worsening over time. The patient had high CRP and high WCC, and was sent to ultrasound square appendicitis. Ultrasound reviewed an inflamed appendix measuring over 13 millimeters uh, in AP caliber and the meson mesenteric edema. And free fluid. Terminal ileum was normal. You can see the appendix here. So that's an inflamed appendix. Uh, so the inflamed appendix um, here, you can see there's lots of wall stratification there. Uh, you can see on transverse view, that's the appendix, like, you know, in the and uh, fluid, sitting, sitting through around there. You can see increased vascularity around the so the submucous of the appendix there. And then you can see normal terminal ileum down here. So what's the case of appendicitis? Um the case of pain, a 30 year old male presented with one day history of regular pain radiating to the underlying heart. Um patient had nausea and tender right here after. CRP was way WCC was normal. Ultrasound reviewed an inflamed appendix measuring 10 millimeters in AP caliber adjacent to the and the and there was adjacent metastatic edema and some reactive lymph nodes in the right iliac fossa. So in this case, um, the interesting part about this case is that the base of the appendix was normal. So this case highlights the need to the importance of 
imaging the entire appendix, trying to make sure you see all the way to the feet, the foam, the distal tip of the appendix. But the day was normal, but then as it gets towards the body, it starts getting in, increased in AP caliber up to the foam. So when I took the measurement here, it was the bit was four millimeters, absolutely normal. And then the body was about seven millimeters, which is abnormal. And then the foam was like 10 millimeters. So if you get one back and if I see you can see increased uh, vascularity there, so vascularity. And in transverse, you can see the uh, increased vascularity of the appendicular artery. And then you can see it on um, B flow imaging as well, where it lights up there. Um, so that's our um, appendicitis. So it, it's quite important to, to lay emphasis on um, on the, 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 the significance of imaging the entire appendix if you can, where possible, because that, actually when it seems normal from the base, don't just stop there, you try to have a good look and make sure you see the entire blind and the of our structure of the bar in, you know, with, with no special piece and no, um, and, you know, compressibility to this normal. Um, so if we think a 42 year old female presented with a five-day history of constant lower abdominal pain. The pain was worse on movement. Blood results were pending at the time of ultrasound. So the patient was ultrasound, but the blood result had not arrived yet. So they wanted us to rule out an ovarian cyst that might have been causing the pain. So we performed an ultrasound, and there was a several millimeter inflamed appendix in the right iliac cluster, which was right at the size of patient's cluster. So we asked them, where is the pain? Here, place the probe there, and we saw this. So, and this was done after we had scanned everything else, the liver, kidneys, gallbladder, ovaries, and everything else. So this is the appendix there, and it measured seven millimeters. So it was non-compressible, blind ending tubular, and transverse, you get like the target um, appearance. You can see it there. So, patient, so the clinician got the result and thought, oh, well, these patient symptoms are not typical of appendicitis. We don't think they are appendicitis. Now that the blood results are back, the WCC is normal, therapy is a bit real, but we don't think it's appendicitis. So, we're going to send it ready for a CT scan, which they did. Send it ready for a CT scan because the symptoms are beginning to improve and they don't have to develop appendicitis. So, CT reviewed a mildly dilated retrocephal appendix with periappendicular stranding, which is a necessary edema suggestive of inflammation. So, CT basically reviewed what we had, uh, what we had seen on ultrasound. Mildly dilated appendix with, you know, um, necessary edema. Maybe in my it's not that prominent, but it was more So, case success. A 27-year-old male presented with one day history of, of abdominal pain and significant right iliac cluster pain. The patient was generally on well, and the patient managed with antibiotics. Um, so, so, um, so yeah, the WCC was raised, but the RP was normal. And the patient was sent to ultrasound query appendicitis. So, ultrasound reviewed an inflamed appendix in the right iliac cluster measuring eight millimeters. In AD caliber, which corresponds to the area of tenderness. So this was just found here, the cecum up here, top left, here was appeared normal. So that's the normal cecum there. Normal wall thickness, you know, like a big gap in the lumen, nothing exciting there. You see the terminal ileum also appeared normal. The elliptical valve is somewhere here. So that all comes into the cecum and then it continues from the distal ileum. You can see the um, bowel, um, luminal gas there in the, in the normal terminal helium. And the right here, of course, is the city appendix. The blind ending, tubular, non compressible structure, measuring about six and then you see that. And it doesn't necessarily um, have to show hypervascularity or color doctor. Sometimes it, some do, some don't. But the key feature in that is that the diagnosis in appendicitis is you know, blind ending, tubular, measuring above. Six mm in AP caliber and usually corresponds to the size of patient's pain. Sometimes you get necessary fast edema, uh, sometimes she does. And sometimes you get increased color doppler, increased color doppler signal, sometimes she does. So, transverse beyond the 
we are with appendix there uh, using the curvilinear probe before the linear as uh, described when I talk about the technique in a six megahertz so you can see the appendix there explained uh, that you know that kind of gives us an idea that the appendix is a twin however when you compare that the difference is you know is massive in terms of looking at the wall of the appendix checking the movement and things like that you get more information using the linear transit of nine megahertz than the six megahertz but this gives you a global um view global understanding of what's going on in that region the case 17 um this is a 22 year old female who presented with an increasing right iliac focal pain for three days so this city was 17 and the doctor was querying appendicitis so i reviewed and explained appendix in the right iliac focal measuring 10 millimeters in ap caliber and this was consistent with appendicitis. So you can see the actual appearance of the inflamed appendix in this patient here. So that's the appendix, same the appendix there. You can see the iliosomal muscles there. You can see the appendix just and then down the muscle was compression already applied, great compression. So it, it brings the appendix up to view. And here, so you can see the appendix, you can see the area being the aggressors being what. Um, um, collapse due to compression. You see normal bowel loop there, and even color, you can see the appendix is inflamed, but not hyperbacterial, not showing color, don't color does not signal. So you can see the iliac vessels there. So, case 18 is the case of a 21 year old female who presented with a day history of right iliac focal pain, nausea. And uh, blood results was uh, obtained. So ultrasound was carried out for so your appendicitis um, to rule out, or ultrasound recorded to rule out appendicitis or ovarian cyst causing patient symptoms. Now, when we carried out, it reviewed an 11 millimeter um, inflamed appendix to the right iliac fossa um, with increased wall vascularity. And there was other same as I edema and some free fluid in the right iliac fossa. So over here we can see the inflamed appendix. So some metastatic edema, metastatic edema wrapping around the appendix there. Uh, in some cases, when the appendix will be curved, you can uh, you can get sort of like it appears like two transverse views of the appendix. So that's uh, that that's the angle of inflammation. Um, so when you follow it down, which you 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 just to follow the entire um the entire um, track, so the entire roots of the appendix along it, so you can see the you can see the edema and some free fluid there. You can see the appendix there and some edema around it, and that is the hyperbacterium there. And the terminal ileum just here, just there. So the terminal ileum there, that's normal. And the appendix. Yeah, so this was a twin view of uh, color of the plant to the um, gray scale. So let's see, I have that clarity and that's the appendix there. So for the 21 year old female, it's um, appendicitis. So case 19. Um, another 21 year old female with a history of. A day history of abdominal pain and um, not here yeah, with guardian symptoms. So you couldn't really touch the region of pain because the patient was really um was really not pain and so she was guarding the pain. Um ultrasound um of the abdomen and pelvis was requested to rule out pseudo ovarian pathology. Um so during the actual examination, the cerebral part patient was pointed at the site of pain, and you know that corresponds to a seven millimeter. Hypervascular um, appendix. So you can see here the normal loop of bowel, and you can see the appendix down here, just all the way here, like that. So that's the inflamed appendix there. On transverse, the, you can see the appendix there, you can see um, edema around them, and there is edema in this um, entire part, the transverse appendix there. And over here, you can see the vascularity of the inflamed, um, inflamed appendix there. 
and you can see when Britain had the TV scan so from free food in the pouch of blood loss, it puts you up to the retrovascular uterus there. So Britain had appendicitis. Um, so yeah, so that's um, about it for the uncomplicated um, appendicitis. So with complicated appendicitis, we have um, inflamed appendix with some other secondary features like the presence of periapendicular collection, um, free fluid in the in the area post appendicoli, um, and evidence of um, appendix perforation. You can find abscesses and and etc. And usually the treatment of um, complicated appendicitis would while around appendectomy or at least uh, or some sometimes open laparotomy, like I mentioned earlier, depending on the features of the thing. So this is a case of a 50 year old male who presented with five day history of central to right lower abdominal pain, nausea, um, reduced appetite. Uh, the patient was clinically tender in the right area for saturating garden symptoms. The VCC was raised. CRP wasn't available at the time of ultrasound, and the doctor wanted to know if it didn't have appendicitis. So, ultrasound reviewed a 14 millimeter inflamed appendix in the right area fossa with an appendicolis at the base of the appendix and significant mesenteric edema and an area of likely hemorrhagic collection adjacent to the base of the appendix. So in the right lap you can see the collection there. Uh, so this is the base of the appendix there. You can see um, on the bright structure there, um, which can like represent an appendicoid, then you see the shadow and posterior cortic shadow to it there. And here you can see a normal bowel loop there. And then um, the collection just here. Um, here you can see collection beta is um, appendicoid there. Um, transverse view of the appendix. And here you can see the base of the appendix. The appendix. You can see the um, appendix and posterior cortical shadow. And in here collection, and then the um, base of the appendix. The same here. So this was a case of um, complicated appendicitis. The patient with that had um, had surgery. They will mostly um, recover from antibiotic therapy, even if they do. There's always an increased chance of immediate imminent uh, recurrence, that's why with the presence of, of uh, an appendicolis in there. So that's most likely part of the mechanical obstruction of the um, appendix, which, which irritates the wall leading to inflammation. There's another case, a 21 year old female presented with um, two day abdominal pain uh, with some vomiting, right lack of tenderness. The BCC was raised, CRP was raised, everyone saw it appendicitis. Ultrasound was, re was requested to rule out appendicitis. And this reviewed a 15 millimeter sticking bowel loop extending into the right adnexus. So the small appendicitis and other than the epidema. So this was a case that wasn't so conclusive on ultrasound when it was performed. So, we using the curvilinear probe we were able to see that's the blood, the blood that you know, we were able to see the appendix diving towards the pelvis there. Um, oh, we saw it well at the time we, we saw it as a, a an abnormal look of bowel. And it was right here for some of the really what else could it be? Um, it could be, you know, I mean it, it looks a lot like the appendix, but but at the time it was a normal, I mean an abnormal bowel. The right here for uh, measuring up to uh, 15 millimeter in AP caliber. And over here, just here, you can see the appendicolis on the posterior acoustic shadow. And there you can see it's a bit hypervascular and power Doppler imaging. So the same patient was then referred to CT for a definite diagnosis. In our trust, the, the um, surgeons don't like. When we don't give a uh, definite diagnosis because they want to know if it's an appendicitis or not. If it's an appendicitis, then the patient goes to a laparoscopic appendectomy and has it removed. If it's not, and the appendix is confirmed to, be, to not be inflamed, then we can get some other kind of required necessary management. So, 
Special Moment Lab CT scan. Um, and CT reviewed, same day, CT reviewed a 14 millimeter inflamed appendix in the right hemicellus with a 10 millimeter appendix, appendicolis, free fluid, head pocket, and some vascular congestion, and an inflammatory um, stranding extending into the pelvis. So this uh, patient would have would have benefited a lot from you know a, a transvaginal ultrasound. Um, after transvaginal ultrasound was done, because we could have not that they would have been able to see the end of the appendix from that part of the appendix in the pelvis to confirm like an infilled appendix, they wouldn't have needed to have the CT scan. However, the CT scan was done and then had um, appendectomy um, almost immediately. And um, 12 days after appendectomy, the patient had some post op collection, so they had to be sent for another CT scan. Um, and then afterwards, eight weeks later, they had another CT scan, which reduced uh, the post op collection and complication at all resolved. So the case 22, um, a 12 year old male presented with abdominal pain, raised inflammatory marker, tender abdomen, fever, and was generally unwell. So, so this was a pediatric uh, patient who was lived in, you know, surely patient was, patient was um, mostly in there with so much pain. Um, you know, it was very unwell. It was, I think it was a Saturday afternoon. Um, the parents were worried. Um, so, yeah, we did an ultrasound on this patient and we reviewed that they had a 10 millimeter um, inflamed appendix with um, echogenic, some echogenic flex within the wall. A heterogeneous collection was seen at the base of the appendix with some edema surrounding the mesenteroid. Surrounding the mesenteroid. Um, she had emergency laparoscopic appendectomy, which revealed that, that you know the structure we found was a gangrenous appendicitis. So these are the images of the patient's um, the images um, acquired from the ultrasound. So this your patient. Um, that's the collection in the right leg foster. You see the collection there, um, and then you can see. The inflamed appendix there. This was a curvilinear probe, and then when you we use the linear probe, we got that as well. You can see that you see a twelve-year-old uh, boy, so it's a very um, small anterior posterior um, body thickness. So you can see the appendix is very close to the skin there, um, and then using the linear transversal, you can see that it increased the uh, mesenteric fat edema transverse view. And you can see that you can see the uh, epigenic flex within the interstitial layer of the appendix, within the wall of the appendix. And you can see here the collection just at the same the base of the appendix. Um, yeah, so we just looked at the learning objectives, which we've um, so far covered the pearls and pitfalls um, of bowel ultrasound. We've covered bowel anatomy, also the bowel ultrasound scanning techniques. We've also covered the normal um, ultrasound appearance of the um, of the ultrasound appearance of, the, of normal appendix and the ultrasound appearance of non-complicated appendicitis as well as complicated appendicitis. So the last um, aspect of this um, presentation today would be on inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so we talked about the known myth of ultrasound um, not being able to examine the bowel. I think by now we can all agree that that's a myth and with newer technologies and lots of trainings, we can definitely examine the bowel quite in a competitive, um, at a competitive level to CT and MRI actually. But this is very dependent on, you know, the region that we're scanning um, and also the pathology and the techniques we adopt. And we, we went through the techniques. So far we've only discussed about uh, transabdominal ultrasound technique, which is the general and widely used um, ultrasound that we, that we all tend to do. Um, however, we also have the endorectal ultrasound technique, which reviews beautiful images of you know the walls of the rectum and helps to classify, identify and classify rectal wall, um, wall lesions. And we also, uh, we've seen a few endovaginal ultrasound images, 
um, that showed, you know, an inflamed appendix in the pelvis next to the ovary and things like that. So yeah, in some cases, the, the, the appendix could extend down into the, into the pelvis. And also we highlighted in the, the importance of visualizing the entire appendix because that's uh, in the cases where the base of the appendix might be normal and uh, the appendix are getting inflamed towards the, 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 the distal part, the fundus, which might in some cases be in the pelvis. We also mentioned the perineal ultrasound technique, which is, uh, we tend to adopt that with, with little ones, with in children, um, and also in, in some adults too, when we want to examine, you know, the, the perianal area, you know, you have cases where you, where you have low-lying Crohn's, uh, Crohn's disease, which is adjacent the anus or um, the distal rectum. And also we have all this um, endoscopic ultrasound that mostly examines the upper GI tract, contrast the answer ultrasound, share with uh, elastography techniques. These uh, two techniques are particularly new in the last 20, 10, 20 years. Um, they are very useful in checking. Contra contrast enhance would help um, check for slow, low vascularity, low, low flow within the, within the walls of the, of the um, abnormal bowel. Um, particularly useful in differentiating between you know, fibrostenotic, um, um, fibrotic stenosis and inflammatory stenosis, which helps you know, determine the, path, the pathway of uh, management for the gastroenterologist. So these are all very useful techniques, but today we're talking majorly about transabdominal ultrasound, and we mentioned a few endovaginal ultrasound as well. Um, we mentioned the pairs of bowel ultrasound, you know, very useful imaging um, tool in investigating the bowel, the real-time feature help us see everything we need um, in real time. We tend to see the peristalsis act in, you know, actively, which is not something you see on CT, um, CT scan. Uh, also, ultrasound gives us very beautiful images of the wall of the bowel. Um, um, ultrasound is you know, widely available. It's, um, it can be done at any point. You know, um, it's not expensive. It's not as, as expensive as you know as CT and MRI um, would be, and you need less. You need just a well-trained with a well-trained sonographer or radiologist, or even a gastroenterologist can just perform a bedside. And you get what you need within 10 to 15 minutes, you get the, the diagnosis. Whereas for MRI, in some cases, you have to wait up to a month on the waiting list and you know and things like that. And you also you need a well-trained radiographer to carry out the MRI, you need the well-trained radiologist to interpret the images before it then gets to, to the to the requester and things like that. And with but with bowel ultrasound, you can discuss with the patient what the findings are. The patient has a better understanding of what you've seen. And, um, and they understand their pathology, their disease condition a bit better just because they are standing next to you while you're doing the exam. I mean, they're laying next to you while you're doing the examination. And contrasting and ultrasound helps to visualize vascularity, like I mentioned earlier. Bit fall, you can image the entire small bowel due to the anatomy. Um, however, if the small bowel is abnormal, you get thick wall, thick walled bowel. You, you, tend to, you tend to visualize an ultrasound in, in most cases, as you can see in the um, sensitivity and specificity um, values of, of bowel ultrasound. Ultrasound is very operator dependent, requires a lot of training, which is why I appreciate the fact that we have quite a lot of people here today. Uh, I'm very pleased with us. We all share a common interest in learning. I, like I said earlier, I would always go any length to, to get um, uh, knowledge you know, wherever it is. and. Uh, yeah, we, since we all love ultrasound, so I believe we should put in um, as much effort as we can, which is what we're doing here on a Sunday to, to, to learn. Um, ultrasound is also very difficult to examine the bowel in obese patients, but not in the table, but, but can be um, um, So we, we, all, we always need very good quality equipment when we scan the bowel on ultrasound, we need a combination of a linear and a curvilinear transducer, and it's difficult to assess the bowel in the pelvis. Um, so the anatomy of the bowel, well, we mentioned that they have stomach, duodenum, duodenum, ileum, terminal ileum, very important landmark um, uh, in examining for Crohn's disease. Terminal ileum is usually where you tend to find, um, a bit on the where you find most um, Crohn's disease occurring. Um, so we tend to like to eat meat. I mean, if you see the images I showed you during the examination of the appendix, 
there are a lot of seminar helium images. We always try to make sure we image that full of um, abnormality. Um, maybe distracted by the, the background noise. So um, the bowel anatomy here, we, I mean, I showed it to you earlier about the anatomy of the bowel. We can all, always have a good look on our atlas of anatomy, of human anatomy, and check the, not the anatomy of the bowel. I've, I'm pretty, I believe most of us must have joined when you know, we got about here. Um, so we looked at the layers of anatomy of the bowel. Guts, we have the normal gut signature that we always need to look out for because bowel wall thickness is the based on literature is the one no, one most important feature of um of bowel ultrasound that we look at we always try to get the water thickness. when the bowel wall is abnormally thickened then it's most likely abnormal it requires further interrogation in that area um also um by presence of vascularity on color doppler tends to give evidence of bowel abnormality i.e inflammation as well um so we also have, uh, so when we look at the, uh, so there's slight variation in the wall thickness of the bowel, the stomach wall has a rugae, which makes it a bit thick up to about six millimeters when it's normal. The, um, the small bowel, about four millimeters, some literature used about three, however, that affects sensitivity and specificity. So we tend to leave, we tend to pair it at four uh, in most cases. I think that's the most widely accepted value in uh, across uh, literatures. Uh, four millimeter wall thickness of the small bowel of the upper limit of normal and up to five millimeters in the large bowel. And um, the common feature in a small bowel is of um, which is more prominent in the upper jet genome than the you tend to see valvulae more in the lumen, uh, when the lumen of the bowel is fluid filled. The large bowels have frustration, uh, which is typical of the anatomy. And also, some of the are seen as the gas at the anterior wall of the bowel there. Just there. And uh, so, this is a, an image of the transverse colon and the descending colon of the 26 year old female. So, that's an ultra, a normal ultrasound appearance of the large um, and that's a normal appearance, an appearance of the duodenum um this stuff slash slash pari um um pylorus and then the jejunum you can see around here you have the head of the pancreas left of the liver so this image was taken right on the epigastrium um and then the scanning technique um, I think I'll stop at the scanning technique, then we continue where we were. So scanning, te scanning technique, we have the, um, we need to scan the entire abdomen and pelvis, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, this helps us rule out other pathologies. I'm sure we all, we saw that we, we encounter some other pathologies, mostly gynae pathologies that admit meat, appendicitis or bowel pathologies. Um, in some cases you find urologic pathologies as well, like you know, kidney stones or stones in the um, in the in the in the um, in the ureter, um, distal distal to the kidneys. Sometimes you find the stone in the in the in the ureter right and right in the aquosa, and that may mix at the stenosis. So it's always important to scan the entire abdomen and pelvis. Um, so use the both log cavilinia and uh, so I'm just going to have, and also remember to apply graded compression techniques. Um, if you need, and also mow the lawn, you need to, to scan the entire small bowel, you need to mow the lawn um, just slowly that way. Or you can do it in reverse like I do, uh, from the sigmoid colon to the left, um, let's say that was a um, region of the this, uh, descending colon, splenic flexure, uh, and then just move the lawn. And then when you want to check the bar, the light bar, just follow that to the transverse colon and then the ascending colon, then the right area goes around the McBurney's points that I mentioned earlier, where you can find the terminal ileum, um, the cecum, and then the appendix somewhere around there. 
So that's um, that's pretty much. And if you need, if in some cases, if you don't find certain structure, particularly the appendix, you can turn the patient onto a lap, left lateral distributor's position, where you'd find where um, due to the orientation and gravity, you know, uh, the rest of the bar tends to move um, to gravity, and then the appendix might come into view. And if you don't, you know, turn the patient back, the bottom line is be dynamic with your technique. You don't necessarily have to stick to one uh, one routine. There's always different ways to get um, the best uh, possible outcome of this. And then we talked about the appendix. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I'd stop the sharing for, uh, for a few seconds and then go back to the video and we continue from, from where we were, if that's okay. So I'm just going to... I'm just going to ask everyone, please, to mute your mic microphones, other than the presenter. Otherwise, the rest of us should be, be muted. Get the video now. All right, so I'm, I'm just going to start the um, video from where we stopped. Thank you. Okay, hello again, everybody. I hope we um, were able to use our break. Um, to do the beat and both and maybe have a cup of tea or something. I I just had some water and uh, um, rested a bit. Um, so yeah, so we can continue now. So far we've covered um, bowel anatomy with bowel ultrasound. We've also uh, discussed on techniques involved, tips and tricks, techniques involved in scanning the bowel. I mean, definitely these things are easier to understand when when we are shown. Um, however, um, I believe, you know, on knowing how other people do this examination can be quite important. Um, I've been to, uh, like I said earlier, I've been to some conferences where um, a number of, um, you know, um, prominent um, gastroenterologists attended that were that are women who have written textbooks and you know, lots of some lots of paper in biology and and they explained how they carry out their bowel of sound. And it's pretty much similar to what I've explained to you. So I can assure you that if we do it the way we've discussed today, um, I think we would mostly be on the right track. So we can go on now to just a highlight and overview of the other um, pathologies, some other pathologies that we commonly find in the bar. So the, the next quite common pathology we find is the clinical bowel disease, which includes Crohn's disease, this, uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And these are the um, the pathologies that we, this, this is the aspect that we'll be talking on in the next 15 minutes or so. Um, and that's going to conclude today's um, presentation. However, um, we can, depending on what the feedback is from you guys and discussion with the Kind uh, organizer, we can have a part two of this uh, of this study of this presentation where we fully talk more in details of um, on um, IBD and also diverticulitis, colitis, intersection, um, small bowel obstruction. I talked about small bowel obstruction a bit today, but yeah, we can talk about it in, in, in detail. Paralytic ileus, uh, toxic megacolon, uh, and some bowel malignancies. So that would be dependent on, on uh, our discussions as part of this presentation. But these are some of the other commonly found bowel pathologies that we can confidently diagnose on ultrasound. So IBD is made up of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Um, so bowel what it means is the single most important or important parameter in the diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Uh, this, there are numerous uh, publications and researches on Crohn's disease, in particular, and other colitis as well. And the most, the, the common consensus, the agreed consensus, is bowel thickness, and in some cases, um, colon doctor uh, are, are 
the key key factors that we use in diagnosing and monitoring Crohn's disease. Um, so in Crohn's disease, both the small and or the large bowel can be affected. Um, and also it can affect different segments of the bowel. So it's called skip lesions, but it tends to have bowel thickening, no bowel thickening, bowel thickening, no bowel thickening. So it tends to be a bit skipped um, um, when it's a uh, case of Crohn's disease. And it's commonly found, and you commonly have lots of um, gut signature. You tend to have um, um, mesenteric edema, mesenteric fat wrapping around the abnormal bowel. Uh, you tend to have increased uh, um, disease, and you can have disease activities um, increased when, which can be similar to um, symptom of anxiety. So, in, in a nutshell, um, there are the symptoms of an, an active Crohn's disease can be mixed up with anxiety. So, you can have patients that will be sent to you for inquiry, with a request for inquiry at anxiety. But when you examine properly, uh, you find that it's not an appendicitis, it's Crohn's disease. So Crohn's appendicitis is also a possibility, but it's, it's, it's very rare, so it's, it's possible. Um, so the disease activity of Crohn's disease um, has been associated with increased flow in the mesenteric vessels and copper vein. So this is a bit of particular aspect now, but these measurements are so they have increased um, PSD, pixel velocity and resistivity in the in the uh, mesenteric vessels and in the copper vein. In some research, but it, the measurements are not specific, and you cannot easily reproduce them because for psychophysiological reasons, um, some patients after having certain meal or things like that, they could have increased PSDs or reduced PSD in their portal vein, and you know, and also even the same sonographer or radiologist could scan the same patient a couple of times and you get different readings. So it's our variability. If you use a G pigment here and you use a canon equipment, you might get different readings as well. So that particular factor isn't popular and uh, not well advised, but you know it's it's worth knowing um, that you can you know play around that sometimes. Um, and I was checking the necessary guesses and the uh, to monitor activities of Um So also, color of power dogger can be used to check for vascularity in the small bowel. Um, however, this is semi quantitative, um, can be quite subjective, and also, you know, machine, machine variability matters um, or comes into play. But it's quite useful and it's reproducible. So it's important to check. Um, color, 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 is call your color, the part of the check of vascularity. If you have other fancy features of a machine like um, microvascular imaging or um, um, B flow, you can use that as well to check of vascularity. However, the, all, the hallmark of checking for vascularity in Crohn's disease is uh, the use of contrast and ultrasound. And that, 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 that beginning to get a lot of global recognition and attention nowadays with um, advanced practice ultrasound. Um, it, uh, the use of contrast and ultrasound, you know, as we know, it doesn't, it doesn't utilize radiation, it's readily acceptable by patients, and you tend to increase and uh, detect um, lower um, low vascularity, and that's quite key when monitoring this. It's also very useful in differentiating between um, fibrostenotic, uh, uh, fibrotic stenosis from inflammatory stenosis um, as, a, as a complication of Crohn's disease, but that's those two are managed differently. Fibre stenosis managed uh, can manage with surgery, um, while inflammatory stenosis is managed with uh, uh, alternative um, treatment when um, checking, when um, when checking, when um, examining the um, when examining the the activity of Crohn's disease. So contrast and understand is very useful to use, very useful in checking vascularity. Um, and, and monitoring Crohn's disease. So the other possible associated finding um, with Crohn's disease are you can find enlarged lymph nodes. Like I said earlier, you can find metastatic fat hypertrophy, and you can find uh, free free around the abdomen in the abdomen. And some complications of Crohn's disease are stenosis, uh, that narrowing of the of the of, of the bowel lumen, which can lead to dilatation, post dilatation, and post dilatation. 
and you can find uh, intestinal fistulae, abdominal abscesses, etc. Um, also remember, bear in mind that the use of elastography, shear wave elastography, is also very, um, very useful in, in in monitoring these activities in Crohn's disease because that helps you check for level of fibrosis in the bowel, the thickened bowel wall. Um, so let's look at this case. This was a 38 year old female that presented with four weeks history of lower abdominal pain. Clinically, uh, the left iliac portion and the right iliac portion was tender. WCC was normal, but the CRP was raised. Now, ultrasound, the patient was sent to ultrasound um, basically to check for appendicitis. Um, so, I shall review the abnormally thickened, non compressible look of bowel, extending from the right iliac portion, central abdomen, left iliac portion, and there was significant tenderness of that along the track of this. Um, this picking bowel, abnormally picking bowel. However, the appendix was not visualized on ultrasound. So, like I said earlier, in our trust, if you don't find the appendix, then to the of PT, just to make sure it's not appendicitis, which is understandable. Um, so, this was the ultrasound image. This is our ultrasound image. Um, if you notice here, we use uh, one of our older machines there. So, we use a 4 megahertz, give us beautiful images of this bowel. And you can see here, it was increased to 5 megahertz here. And you can see the difference. So, this here gives more detail of the Wall. So you can see this submucosa of the, you can see it here, and everything was about 17 millimeters in the caliber. That's a lot. The individual bowel wall was probably around about um, maybe 8.5, 8, 8.5 uh, millimeters in the caliber. That was way off. Um, and that was a small bowel, by the way. So I think it involved the terminal ileum, but they extended from the right layer of the to the left layer of the and skipped along. So you can see from the right layer of the you can see the, um, um, right iliac vessel there, and then you can see the bowel wall. So you, you, with with twelve, a scale of twelve uh, um, on the color Doppler scale, we we couldn't get any vascular reading there. Um, but however, if we had used maybe contrasting as ultrasound or some or a fancy feature on the new equipment like micro vascular imaging, we might have been able to get to detect uh, the vascularity. You know. Um, possibly. So when we switched to linear transistor using a 9 megahertz, we couldn't really get much information that we don't already know. We didn't get anything we don't already can see that there. So when I, if I go back to the previous slide, you see the, the bar or the unit 5 megahertz. So this, this, this is a clear example of the, of the importance of the use of both transistors, curvy linear and linear. Neither of them is useless. We need to use both of them. When it comes to our ultrasound examination, so you can see the image there. So the same patient, uh, remember, it was a 38 year old female, 38 year old female with four weeks history of lower abdominal pain and raised CRP normal and WCC. So, so ultrasound, like I said, reviewed that we thickened that we are about look there. Um, so the same patient was sent for um, a contrast uh, CT examination. Um, later uh, on the same day, uh, this reviewed an abnormal thickening of the, of the long segment of the terminal ileum with inflammatory evidence. The sickle and ascending colon showed some evidence of inflammation around it, um, and there was multiple there were multiple reactive lymph nodes um, around, and there was a normal retrofecal appendix in transverse colon, um, uh, descending colon, and part of the um, sigmoid colon, where they all showed a slight evidence of inflammation, but nothing significant. So MRI was done later that so that was basically thickening of a long segment of the terminal area. So MRI was done uh, later that week, 10 weeks later, which showed a 15 to 20 centimeter segment of variable wall thickening of the distal ileum um, to the ileocecal valve with absent peristalsis. Uh, marked inflammation of the stigma colon, and that was pretty much it. And the conclusion was active Crohn's disease. So, if we go back to ultrasound, you can see. So, this taking you look of bowel did not review any uh, peristalsis within it. There was no combination, there was no um, luminal, luminal narrowing or um, stenosis or evidence of stenosis around. Um, so, that was um, a case of active uh, Crohn's disease. So this was the this were the CT images.
images here, and pretty very strong value and um, coronal um, segment there, and the sagittal segment here on the bar. And these were the MRI images of the same patient, the one that was born, that was born 10 weeks later. So, yeah. so now um, a bit coincidence. So we move on to the next um, slide. So ulcerative colitis. Now, ulcerative colitis is also the second part of um, inflammatory bowel disease. So ulcerative uh, colitis, unlike Crohn's, involves the mucosa of the colon. Remember the layer, the five layers of the bowel. Um, sterosa, um, muscular structure, submucosa, mucosa, and mucosa interface. So, hyper, hypo, hyper, hypo, hyperechoic layers of the bowel. Um, so, the osteoarthritis uh, sorry, sorry, involves mucosa of the colon. Um, and it, it travels in a retrograde extension, retrograde fashion from the rectum down the rest of the color. Um, just a point to so I like uh, on current uh, so current disease involved can occur anywhere along the bowel from the anus all the way up to um the anywhere within the bowel all the way up to the esophagus and beyond. So um but also the paralysis extends from the rectum um the of rectum retro retrograde fashion sigmoid colon uh, descending colon transverse colon ascending colon and it mostly only involves the large bowel, it rarely involves the small bowel. Um, the typical feature is increased wall thickness of the colon, which is still ultrasound. The gut signature can either be preserved or lost. In terms of the gut signature, it is also lost. Um, and in active inflammation, you can have increased wall vascularity. Of it became more. Usually, you don't get, you don't, you shouldn't have an increase. You shouldn't even really have much vascularity in the wall of the bowel of the large bar and vascular. But in an active inflammation, you have increased wall vascularity of the thickened wall. Um, so, in a way, the bowel ultrasound, ultrasound shops so differentiate between Crohn's disease and also the polarities by checking the location of the disease. So, with Crohn's, you tend to mostly have it in the terminal area, and you can have a um, kid's lesion and something like that. Uh, Fertile colitis hardly ever involves the um, small bowel. However, it travels in a retrograde fashion from the rectum, sigma colon, the second colon, channel of colon, uh, like that. So, uh, so, the location of the disease will help you determine what, uh, which of the two it is uh, on ultrasound. And also, you know, so it's very to have more of the mucosa, um, you know, it tends to affect the mucosa layer of the large bowel. Uh, like because that's how you don't necessarily tend to so you tend to have um highly you know increased thickness in the place for like this to involve a lot more um also um you still you, you tend to have um the presence of gut signature is preserved usually in operative colitis and uh, the surrounding mesenteric fat involvement so you don't tend to have anything mesenteric in the most mesenteric colitis but you tend but you, more common in Crohn's disease. Um, the use of contrast and ultrasound would help us show um, what hypervascularity and it would, it's used to evaluate treatment with all. So it can it can reveal mucosa healing, um, evidence of mucosa healing um, in, uh, in the bowel or after treatment. So still use it quite useful when it comes to monitoring IDD. Complication of other arthritis uh, colitis, toxic megacolon, and photo um, mesenteric vein thrombosis, which can be well examined using these. So, if we look at this case, this is a 24, 21 year old female who presented with four day history of pain in the right iliac fossa, right iliac fossa pain, um, nausea, diarrhea. Uh, with watery, uh, watery um, uh, blood, watery stool which, which contains blood. CRP was raised, WCC was raised, and patient was requested, was sent to ultrasound, and ultrasound request was made, query appendicitis. So on ultrasound, we found a um, mild thickening of the sigmoid colon, descending colon, transverse colon, and ascending colon. The transistor 
was that there was potentially a tenderness observed along the sigmoid, excuse me, along the sigmoid and the transvascular. The sigma and appendix appeared normal, and uh, also epipolysis was suggested on ultrasound. And the patient had the CT scan two days later, which confirmed, which also suggested a and colitis um, and recommended stool sample and further investigation endoscopy if need be. So this was the um, this was the this were the images obtained on ultrasound. So this is the sigmoid colon here. We see we use the high frequency nine mega transistor here. So that's the sigmoid colon. You see the root gear of the of the colon and uh, that's why it's thick there you can see. So you saw the normal colon I showed you previously and this is nowhere near it. So you can see the we lost that fine uh, um you know fine layer of of um colon colonic gas and the anterior wall of the colon and now we can see the entire colon the thickening Thank you. 
also had a seat this time with him because we didn't see and then still see that then they could come to join the city that they were at the time um so we had a seat this time and city was reported to be difficult to interact with due to the difficulties of the ground um i had the appendix wasn't in flame and the findings were concurrent uh, so as well um so you can see the appendix colleagues there at the base of the appendix they also found the appendix colleagues they didn't think the appendix was a claim and cc was concerned that the uh the call was also um in a large a large with some inflammation around it so the graphic ruled out for the party and uh the sound the sound was very useful in this case because regularly um referred to the ultrasound when you have to talk saying from the image of the ultrasound you know we think we don't think this is uh this is everything this is fully in line with what it's going to be maybe um it's going to be the height is um and we you know we suggest you treat it as about this and if not if nothing changes then try out some school um investigation um and you know see what you find so that was that was that was that 